Hello and welcome to Angel's Costumes Behind the Scenes. I'm Jeremy Angel. I'm Richard Green. And I'm Jonathan Lippmann. And today we're going to be airing my fairly recent interview with Philip Phil Goldsworthy. Goldie. Nothing nothing like confusing having two, two lots of aliases, eh? Especially if you don't like one of them. <laughs> no, he doesn't. That's true. It's true. Interesting chat. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking about it afterwards. But for now, here he is. Mr. Goldsworthy. We hope you've been enjoying these interviews. We've definitely been enjoying your feedback. If you have any questions or requests, please email us at podcast at angels.co.uk. You can visit our website, which is www.angelsbehindthescenes.com, or you can find us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are forward slash costume podcast. And here is Richard's chat with Phil Goldsworthy. Hello, my name is Richard Green, and I'm really, really pleased and slightly relieved to be talking to <laughs> Phil Goldsworthy today. Relieved because this is about the third time we've had a crack at connecting this. Um, two techno idiots uh, talking to one another. But Phil, good afternoon, or Goldie, possibly. I don't know which do you prefer. There's nothing I can do about the Goldie. That's just stuck. That's. Uh, but you don't li- you don't like it, presumably. I don't mind it. It's just uh, it was one of those things that. Uh, I've never had a nickname at school or anything. And then uh, I think it was on Saving Private Ryan, uh, Lil Heyman. On the radio, yeah. I was going, go for gold. And people went, oh, gold, yeah, gold. And then it just stuck. And, of course, yeah. that was con- a- an early film for me. So from then on, I've always been known as gold in the film industry. It's my surname, so it's not too bad. No, I suppose it's the other thing, you know, call me anything you like, provided you don't call me late for dinner. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, so you touched, you talked about about school, and and I do know a little bit about this. But you know, one of the questions we always ask, I mean, you you know the concept of this. This is to introduce people who don't know how our wonderful industry works, or who are interested in it and just gen or in it and want to know a little bit more. But yeah. The first question we always kind of ask is, you know, how did you get into this? Well, I think I mean as far back as I can remember, I've always wanted to be in the film industry, not necessarily costume, but. Um, I remember, I mean, my dad always had a cine camera around his neck all the time when I was growing up. So I was kind of aware that, you know, light goes through celluloid and, you know, we could watch ourselves on the dining room, you know, wall a couple of, a couple of weeks later after the film got developed and, uh, and actually see ourselves. And that was kind of, so that went in. And I think there was a few things when I was a kid, it was like, um, I remember my dad had a friend, uh, who worked for the BBC and, uh, Swap shop was on at the time, which was like a four hour early morning yeah, breakfast. No Edmonds. And I remember watching, um, I don't know, I must have been about six or seven, but I remember watching Noel Edmonds eating a scone at home while I was there. And then we <laughs> drove up to the television center at Wood Lane and uh, we kind of had a look at the set. And, uh, and there was that scone behind the table that he sat at, sort of thing. So I kind of realized about live television and and the potential of it and everything. And then, right. so all the way through school, it was, I was either acting or art, theatre, design and technology. I was not that hot at the kind of, uh, you know, the ologies or whatever. And so by the time I did my A-levels, I, I stayed on after doing my O-levels. I was in a grammar school in Walthamstow. And right. they, they had just turned from doing, you know, further education. So the sixth form consisted of, eight or nine of us and my subjects were was art theater studies and design and technology for which most right. of the teachers said well you can't do that they're not serious subjects you're just going to have a laugh for two years you know you've got to have an ology you know anyway I stuck to it and it was kind of like acting well I can get in the film industry as an actor or directing I can get in the film industry as directing the costume wasn't on the radar at this stage right but then part of the a level two years at a level doing design and technology was I made a kind of animatronic robot head for the young engineer of Great Britain. And it did very well in that. So so that was, I kind of had a portfolio. Also, on the other hand, I was acting and my drama teacher said, you know, when I finished doing my O-levels, um, you're going to miss acting. So I joined the National Youth Theatre. I got into the National Youth Theatre. And that was really when I first right. came to Angels was Tim uh, Angel very kindly, and I believe still does, fitted us all out, all the actors that were performing. Yeah. 
for nothing, yeah, no, you know. We, yeah, yeah, we, we, we still do that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it was great. And occasionally when I am at Angels, I do actually see the green frock coat I wore playing Seleucia So Trigger in Sheridan's The Rivals, uh, <laughs> which was still Did there still in, the, in the... Yeah, no, it was still hanging there in the Barry, in the Barry Lyndon section. And... Um, <laughs> Can you get into it though, Phil? Well, no, but no, 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 not at all now. And so I guess that was about 1988, 89. So with yeah. these two things going on with the acting and the young engineer, Great Britain, I kind of like started knocking on doors. And I remember my dad taking me up to Shepparton and Pinewood. And I was really into like prosthetics and makeup and acting and, and you know, and the whole the whole project for the young engineer was a kind of latex skin face that goes over a, a, an exoskeleton and it right. all had stepper motors inside and it all worked off a BBC Acorn, uh, you know, 1K computer. And I guess yeah. at the time it was kind of quite revolutionary and a lot of people took interest in it. So I knocked on doors and I ended up getting work at animated extras and image animation with Bob Keane and doing bits and pieces, you know, not fully fledged in films, but if there was stuff. So I, I did a lot of kind of horror films or films of the time. And then I ended up working on A Kiss Before Dying, which was my first film. Again, not costume. What? My first costume film was The Fifth Element, the Luke Besson. I was going to say, that's, that's that, the, the Kiss Before Dying thing I didn't know about, because obviously on your IMDb credits, Fifth Element is the first one that comes up. Exactly. Costume fabricator at that point. Just tracking back a little bit, was your dad in the business? Is your dad no. in the business? No, no okay. my dad was a civil servant. I didn't have anyone in the business at all. Right. It was purely knocking on doors and going through the knowledge and, you know, annoying people, really. No. Well, and, you know, why break the habit of a lifetime? No, I mean, just what you were saying about your dad taking you to studios and things, I was thinking that's really, that's really great, you know, to actually actually have that kind of support as a, as a youngster. Yeah, I think at the time it was like the, the film... Or maybe you just wanted to get rid of you, I don't know. I mean, yeah, well, was... <laughs> I know. I mean, it, it's funny because, you know, back then, you know, in the late 80s, you could just drive into the studio and, oh, I'll come here to see so-and-so and you get in. Now it's a different kettle of fish. But, <laughs> yeah, just you know, I had a lot of, you know, I, I was doing films like Waxworks 2 and Highlander 2 and Hell, uh, Nightbreed and a lot of films that were done by Image Animation, uh, Bob Keane's firm at, at, at Pinewood. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, I went in with a portfolio with a robot head and the Kiss Before Dying job was a one in three scale model of a building in New York, which they shot the camera down. And it was the old Hitchcock effect of like Sean Young falling off the building and seeing her point of view as she flies down yeah. the building. But they're all skills that I'd learned at school. And, um, my school was very, you know, Sir George Monarchs, which is still going in Walthamstow. Mm-hmm. Um, we were, we were kind of like the first of the the first of the A level students, you know, to come out of that old grammar school, and and it went from there. But it was on and off, you know. It was difficult back then. There wasn't much being made, and uh, if you didn't get on that film, then that was it. And the reason it's not an IMBD because they didn't get credits on anything, and I was only doing bits and pieces of work for uh, a company that was farmed out, if you like. But um, the real breakthrough was with Fifth Element, which yeah. there was that amalgamation of kind of costume effects, creatures, and the costume department. So um, that was a good thing to start on. And that was my first kind of foray into costume. And even then, I was a maker. So I helped make the New York Cops and the Mangalores and the Monda Show. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the then supervisor, Janet T. Brook, said, well, you know, you made this you made the New York cops. Do you want to do standby with them? You know, like look after them while they're, while we're filming, which I didn't know what standby was really back then. It was like kind of, you know, you're on yeah. set and you're looking after the actual actors and, or whoever the stunts. So that's, that was the transition really from the start of the transition of being a maker to being a costumer. Yeah. So it was that time when departments were coming together, if you like, and, and now costume departments will have their own, costume effects within the department without having to go elsewhere to, to get stuff done. Yeah. And Janet, Janet was a, was a, a great supervisor. Ooh, wasn't she? I love Janet. Yeah. She used to have a fag in one hand. I was going to say never, never without, never a without a fag. She'd be doing the ironing <laughs> with a fag and the ash would drop on the shirt or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And she'd iron yeah. that in. Uh, and then, and then come sort of like about 11 o'clock, she'd put the spuds on 
and to get the bed <laughs> job. And then we all had to come, you know, um, Jill and Adrian and me, Joe Hobbs and that. We'd all have to sit down at like one o'clock because back then it was a 12-hour shoot day. So you always wrote for an hour for lunch. Now yeah. you, yeah. you don't have the 12-hour shoot. You have the 10-hour continuous. Back then we'd all have a proper sit down, sit down meal in the wardrobe, and <laughs> with, you know, with Mother Janet. Yeah, yeah, and Luke Bestnot would come along on one occasion and have dinner with us with the Thierry, Thierry Albergast, uh, the DOP, and I think um, Jean Paul Gaultier actually came along at one point and so like sat down and had some spuds <laughs> with us and, and and had a little meal with the costume department. But that's the way Janet worked, and she was great. Yeah, she really was. So, and then, you know, I start scrolling up the screen and I go, my God, what you've done, what you haven't done. I mean, you you know, it's it, it's a pretty impressive body. Well, it's not pretty impressive. It's a very impressive body of work. Well, I think I was kind of fortunate that I started my costume with a film like Fifth Element. And I think the film industry at the time was just started getting back on its feet. I mean, everything mm. kind of finished after Batman and, the scaffolding was still up, but the films weren't being made, you know, and um, yeah. whether that was to do with the government or there were, just wasn't much happening in the early, early 90s. And then, you know, mid 90s, something changed and then some big films started coming in. And it just so happened that, I, you know, the first person I worked for as a director was Luke Besson. Then it was Steven Spielberg and then it was Tim Burton. So it, they all kind of happened quite quickly together. Because you did Sleepy Hollow. You worked on Sleepy Hollow as well, didn't you? Sleepy Hollow, yeah, with Colleen. That was the first yeah. time I worked for Colleen Atwood. Mm. And that was great. I was just looking after the headless horseman. I mean, I worked a lot with John Bloomfield back in the day, who was kind of, I kind of put down as my kind of mentor, really, because yeah. of how clever he was at, yeah, making yeah. stuff like quite simplistic but incredibly effective. You know, I mean, I did uh, the Mummy films with him, and I was I was amazed with him how he could like, uh, you know, make a pair of Reebok trainers for Rachel Weiss uh, up a pair of ladders look like a pair of high heeled shoes. And yeah, that big look, library, that library scene where it all yeah, it exactly. All and it's like yeah. Oh, yeah. you look at it, yeah. you a pair of trainers, but he knew what yeah. you could get away with on on camera. Yeah. I know he, yeah. he he tells us he used to tell a story to me that when he did Conan back in the 1980, I think John Melius said, "Oh, listen, I want some guys up there right on that ridge in the background, you know." And John said, "Well, what what are they? Barbarians or this or that? What kind of tribe are they?" Sort of thing. And John Melius said, "Listen, it doesn't matter. They're so far away, they could be monkeys smoking pipe." So John, <laughs> bless him, you know, because he he dressed them up as monkeys with pipes. You know, brilliant. until <laughs> until Melia went, what you know, what the hell are you doing? You know, and he said, "What well, you said," and that's when you know, you that's when you've got to have that thing with the director. It's like everything's important. You, you do see everything, and and yeah. it shouldn't be just be a throwaway thing of just give me this, give me that. You know, you do need no. specifics. So I think that was John's sense of humour. It kind of like you know, <laughs> yeah. you one of, one of the worst one of the worst phrases I think is it'll do. Well, it it won't. It might do for an advert, but it won't do. Yeah, for a, for a thing, especially you know, since now with with cameras and steady cams, everybody's moving in and out of all over the place. Oh, there's things. You know, the idea of back line, front line's gone completely, hasn't it? Exactly. So, um, there's you know, yeah. there's cameras yeah. you don't even know a, a film. You know, they're so yeah. cool, you know, they. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. the thing with Colleen. She was great at like everyone goes out of this costume tent hundred percent. There's no like. Yeah. You know, let's yeah. get them down to set 100, percent and you know, let's go into the crowd just as much detail as we do the principles. So yeah, John was great at just making stuff and making. You know, we on the Mummy Returns, we had two armies on the set. I did a lot of second unit, you see, to start with, which is a good place yeah. to cut your teeth because you're yeah. with the stunts, and you know, that's a whole kettle of fish in itself. Yeah, the sort of, the sort of sticky end, as it yeah, were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a lot of sticky films. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Saving Private Ryan. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. It? <laughs> no, it's true. Saving Private yeah. Ryan, uh, messy, sticky films, you know, uh, with the blood yeah. and everything and Black Hawk Down. So you kind yeah. of get, I wouldn't say pigeonholed, but I certainly did a lot of second unit, a lot of action films, a lot of war films, a lot of adventure films, fantasy so I've I've kind of stayed in that kind of ilk for some time, and which is not a bad place to be. No, 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 no. But I yeah, mean, I mean, know. John with the Arcadian Sumerians battle at the beginning of the Mummy Returns is like mm. Kenny going on about the checky bags on his podcast. But we literally had two armies of two hundred and fifty on each side, and 
John's design was just so simplistic with kind of, you know, a leather hood, a, a leather pet skirt, and then some uh, dolly danglers, we called them around the arms, and then some sandals, that you could literally put the entire costume in one checky bag. And because there was only two sides, it was like, right, you lot have red checky bags, you lot have blue yeah, checky blue. bags, <laughs> and, and there's your bag. And then when we're moving location, you take your bag with you, put it on that truck, because they were the Moroccan army, you know, so yeah. they did exactly what they were told. And we just shifted everything. I don't think we even had rails in the end. We just had the uh, checky bags all in a row. It was great. <laughs> yeah, but that was, you know. The silly thing now, Phil, is that they probably only use like 25 or 50 on each side and they'd CGI the others. And it would Absolutely. probably cost way more than it would have done with your, your checky bag concept. And John Bloomfield is one of those what I call quiet designers. You know, he, he, he gets on with it. Not a lot of noise, not a lot of fuss. Yeah, yeah. He knows what he's doing. Yeah, and presumably you'd have worked with Anne as well, because um, I spoke to Howard Burden on one of these, and how you know was was at Wimbledon and had that sort of association. And John and, and of course Anne Beverly um, was was teaching at Wimbledon. Yeah, so. Anne from Wimbledon mm. was always with him. Um, yeah. I mean, John was yeah. quiet a lot of the time because he had Dave Murphy as his supervisor. So, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, yeah, I mean, I've only worked with Dave a couple of times, because, although I think I think somebody said he likes to be called David, you know, and I went, oh, right, does he? Black Hawk Down, of course, was another one of, of, of Mr. Murphy's. Wasn't yeah, it? bless him. Yeah, I miss yeah. David. He, yeah, um, I do too. Yeah, jo uh, John Bloomfield always had David as his supervisor, and uh, mm. that was good. And then, um, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, Dave was good. I think Black Hawk Down was probably his last thing he did actually uh, properly. That was a big one with a Ridley. But uh, again, yeah. that was a messy, sticky film. So, well, yeah, I was going to say, I think I think you're pretty right. And of course, we still got some of the kit. Funnily enough, I had an inquiry today about have you, you know, have you still got some Black Hawk Down kit because somebody wants to wants to use some of it. So, yeah, we have. We have got all those back formed helmets that that you guys had done. That's um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the. Yeah. <laughs> The actual, the actual militaries, they, they said they loved them. They wanted to march in them and everything because they were like, they were like, <laughs> yeah, they were like, they were light. like half, yeah. half light. And they said, we can, you know, we can pull the wool over <laughs> someone's eye with these sort of thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, just not very ballistic. But I but mean, Private Ryan right. was another one which was kind of, you know, a, a big, big thing to, to happen yeah. early on in one's career, yeah. you know. So I'm, I'm fortunate in that respect. And uh, it was a great kind of uh, class of, 97 you know with the steggles and and dave crossman and a lot of ex-angels people yeah yeah dave dave whiting of course dave, well right? dave yeah dave and pete edmonds you know i mean it was yeah great. yeah uh, yeah and, and and just a just a few minutes pause there for you know pete edmonds God, yeah yeah sad. yeah very sad you know it's very like sad. you know it's yeah. kind of a, a bit of an end of an era really because that's where like mm. me and marcus love and the steggles and and neil murphy and that, we all come up during that yeah. period of time, you know, and, and Dan Grace and that. And uh, yeah. we'd all worked with him, we'd all, and Dave White, and, 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 you know, they were great crack. They were great fun to work yeah. with. And they knew their yeah. beans and onions, you know. They certainly did. And it's interesting, actually, because, you know, I always tend to think that our industry is, is sort of woman-heavy um, on, on the costume side. But, in fact, you know, you just mentioned, what, nearly a dozen, a dozen guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, yeah. just in the UK side of it. Never mind. Um, I never think it was it. pretty 50 50. I don't know. I mean, I've never done the ratios really. I, I, I don't know. I think there was more male designers back in the day than there are now. I don't. But then thinking about it, no. You know, I, yeah. I haven't, I haven't yeah. done a dossier yet, but uh, maybe. well, and if you, if you think about supervisors, it's Tiny, Johnny Hilling, Frank Vinyl. Oh, know, back in the day, yeah. Back yeah. In the day. yeah. Yeah. So. So basically, learning your craft, keeping your head down, doing what you need to do, and and gradually getting more of a reputation, more of a reputation. I mean, I know at the moment you're down as as armory, um, armory designer, aren't you? On this yeah, one? I'm. Uh, I'm armor supervisor on mm -hmm. the project that I'm doing at the moment, which which is for right. legal reasons we cannot mention. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But no, it's great. Right. It's like I mean. People do read into titles a lot, but yeah. it's, uh, and you've got to have a title. There's all sorts you can do within the costume department, you know? Sure. And they're a lot bigger than they used to be. I mean, I guess back in the day, there was like, you know, on The Mummy, there'd probably be about 10 of us total, <laughs> including the workroom yeah. and the fan buys. But it's like, yeah. and you did, yeah. the whole, you did the whole film and it was fine. But I, I, you just can't do it anymore. It's like, it's the, the industry's changed so much. For the better, I think. I think it's easier 
to get in now and because departments are bigger within within the costume yeah and but it's still the rudiments are still the same on this one got the uh, casting and and the leather workers and the workroom and then the costume props and everything so yeah. it kind of balloons but yeah I think it's just kind of keeping keeping to your guns and you know it hasn't been easy in when there was only kind of three or four before Netflix and everything like that when there was only like yeah. three three films a year maybe if you didn't get yeah. on if you didn't get on a film then you had to go and do something else and I've certainly yeah. done loads of other jobs when in between film. But just keep going and yeah, send your CV yeah. off and blanket cover your CV because it's the laws of probability. If you send 50 CVs off, you might get a hit on one. And that's yeah. what happened to me on Fifth Element. I was doing another job, I think, just packing boxes and what have you. And I just had my uh, first child at the time. And mm -hmm. Ben Burnham rang up out of the blue because I'd sent my CV. They needed somebody. And uh, I fitted the bill. So yeah. all of a sudden yeah. I was there with a you know, making the bandoliers on the New York cops, which are a great design. Yeah. And, you know, going down Toys R Us and finding kids' ray guns and don't tell anyone this, cutting them up and basically <laughs> half of the New York cop is Toys R Us and uh, plumbing <laughs> plumbing fittings from, um, you know, plumbing shops. Well, that, that, sounds, that sounds on a par with the sort of stuff that John Bloomfield did. Yeah, right? exactly. I That's know. why I said John was like a kind of yeah. mentor because it, it was that thing of like, there's it, a drawing. And it's a sci-fi drawing, and they were comic book artists from Fr France. I mean, Luc Besson had had this project going since he was a kid, and there was a lot of artwork involved. And, you know, when you see artwork, it's like, well, do we make that, in, you know, or do we retrofit it? Can we find this from somewhere else? And, you know, and I, I did go to Brent Cross and, and buy some really big ray guns for kids, but there were interesting bits within that moulding. And we yeah. just get it on the bandsaw. And I know it sounds kind of corny, but get it on the bandsaw, get it artworked, add some bits to it, and, and away you go. And that's mm. and that was really the bandolier. And like and plumbing fittings and shower hoses and all stuff like yeah. that. But yeah. when you put it all together, you're never going to know. <laughs> I'm doing a bit of that yeah. on this film as well. But um, <laughs> get, it's fantasy, armour. So, yeah. Yeah. Getting back to this whole sort of size of crews and things, why do you think there are so many people on them? I mean, I know we've now got things like clearance. You know, once upon a time there was legal and once upon a time there were accounts. Now there's clearance. Everything, but everything has to be cleared. But it is interesting because when you look at some of those big films that you were working on in the early days, you, you drift people in for big crowd scenes, but there wouldn't be that many people full time on a show, would there? No. No, I, I mean, it's an interesting one because the films still stand up. Yeah. You could almost go back and say, well, how did they ever make uh, films without radios? Because everyone's talking on the radio to each other. But yeah. a film like Ben-Hur or Launch of Arabia with massive crowds, yeah. you've got the runners yeah. going in between, the, you know, the running around and, and, and sending messages to each other. Yeah, literally by, runners. Literally, literally runners. runners. Yeah, no, that's yeah. where it comes yeah. from. And it's, it's kind yeah. of... But I, I think... As films have got smaller, they've got bigger. It's like um, the the. I mean, there's not too many epics being made anymore. You know, like back in the seventies no. and eighties, where that you know you'd have. I mean, the last thing I did, which was truly, truly epic, was uh, Four Feathers with. Uh, Ruth I was just Myers. about to say. I mean, Four Feathers with with Ruth must have been a pretty. Hefty, yeah, I think we went up to one. sort of like with the the British Army and the Mardis and the Coolies and uh, and the Egyptians. I think we kind of got up to sort of like three to 4,000 on the big, big yeah. days when everyone yeah. was, you know, in focus and yeah. everyone was like playing. Which is probably, probably Gordon of cartoon type numbers, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Charles one yeah. is probably that kind But of we did do it with less numbers. I don't really know the answers apart from we must have been crazy and we probably, <laughs> we probably wouldn't be around now if they'd carried on with the numbers we were doing because yeah, we were literally yeah. getting up at, you know, when you're young and keen, you think of getting up at three in the morning, driving for an hour in the desert, starting dressing at four o'clock, and then not finishing the final costume till sort of like eleven in the in the morning, and they're yeah. still coming down onto set. It's like yeah. you don't want to do that all your life, but it's fine when you're <laughs> well, young. Yeah. So, yeah. and I think there's 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 so much going around now with the with all the Amazon and Netflix and everything that that it seems to be very buoyant and there are jobs that for example i used to we used to do breakdown ourselves you know break down the costumes we you wouldn't have a you'd have dyeing uh, department but not 
physical breakdown of costumes and the director would normally say this and that's too clean break it down and you'd do it on set and that would yeah, be part yeah. of the part of your part of your cv would be doing break breakdowns and yeah. that's now a whole department as i said before armor making and cos props would normally be farmed out to back in the day to a, an effects house or a, a model model house and they'd do their bit and and then you'd receive goods so I think now the departments have got bigger because they're doing it more in-house, which is a shame for the smaller companies that uh, haven't really succeeded. Well, they don't exist anymore because there's not so much a need for these smaller smaller effects, prosthetics places. And and everything. Everyone know, becomes yeah. independent. So you, yeah. you get someone on a film that's your prosthetic designer and they bring a team in and they're part of the crew yeah. as opposed to before you'd go to them and show them the drawings or whatever and then they, it would be farmed out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think well, that's again, one, of the, one of the things. And again, I suppose the other thing is now because a lot of the films actually want to own everything that they're, they're, they're doing or at least the sort of the main parts of it. You know, Absolutely. Got an eye on, eye on either selling it afterwards or exhibiting it or maybe doing a second one because again i suppose there's a lot of these kind of we'll make one then we'll make another one then we'll make another one then we'll make another one i guess they 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 want to sort of keep it under their control a little bit more i suppose yeah there's all that yeah, yeah. i mean yeah it, it's all become big business isn't it it's it's yeah. Uh, yeah. it's the merchandise it's the it's the comic con it's the you know the the superhero yeah. stuff it's it's everything that comes with it it's the figurines it's you know, <laughs> yeah. If you think yeah. about it, it's just monumental compared to. It you is, know. and you know, when when you think about it, if if you if you did go to Toys R Us to use your ray gun bits, now you'd probably have to get clearance from them before you. Can oh yeah, them. I mean, it's all gone a bit silly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. S- s- silly is one of the words I was I was I was. Yeah, you have to get clearance it. for everything, you know. Yeah, and and it's all become highly secured, and yeah. It's, I don't know if it's as fun as it was anymore. I don't know whether that's to do with the people. If you get a fine, mm. fine crew together, and um, a yeah. film can be a most enjoyable thing. And I still do have really great times on films and, and then not so great times on other films. And it, it all does hinge on the director and the people you're working with. Yeah. The standard, yeah. of, the standard of, of talent is never diminishes, but, but the, the personalities do sometimes. Personalities certainly do, don't yeah. they? Which is your favourite bit? I mean, you, you basically seem to have done all of it, really. You, I don't. Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, I thought I'd say that before you do, Richard. <laughs> but, uh, I know. It's like, you know, you've been on set, you've been at the sharp end, you've yeah. been breaking, breaking down, you've been doing large crowd numbers, you've been supervising, you know. Is it a case of I'll, I'll, anything that I enjoy doing, I'll do, and I don't care what you call me? Um, or is it? Is, is there well, an area that you particularly like? I, I, I mean, Kenny always says to me, I became a supervisor because the supervisor I was working for, I thought I could do a better job. And he's probably got right. a point there, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. But back in the day, a supervisor would be on set, he'd do the tents, he'd do the crowd, he'd do... Now a supervisor is so much computerised work, it's so much uh, at a desk and budget. It's, yeah. it's all become mechanised into, as we know, I'm a total technophobe, so give me... <laughs> as, we, as we both proved this yeah, afternoon. exactly, that, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, Excel spreadsheets, great, but not for me, thanks, <laughs> you know. I'd rather yeah. have it on a big whiteboard, but... Producers don't want that. They want it all in a nice file and sent off. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it's an ongoing thing. So the job's changed. or well, the job hasn't changed. It's just the technicality of doing it's changed. Mm. Um, I mean, my favourite times have been on set with the with the camaraderie, with the crew. Right. This, this is kind of what I was getting at, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, that's basically, kind of you're, you're da- when you're down and dirty, you're kind of happiest, are you? I'm very happy doing that kind of stuff. But it does come a stage in your life. I'm, I'm nearly the half century, and, and it's yeah. that thing of you can't do it all the time. And I've had my time on set, and I think now it's like I need to move on slightly. Mm-hmm. But I'm not saying I'm not going to do standby, but that's where I've enjoyed it the most. Yeah, but I, the ideal thing is like a film like this for me, whereas I've started at the beginning, right from the very yeah day, day one, one almost really. yeah and, as soon as you know, came on there, we're not were. shooting yeah. for, for quite a few months um mm. and you get inside you know basically you're working alongside with a designer so it's yeah. it's you know you you obviously do have a, a say and an input into the overall look and that's mm. that's that's very um that's good that's good for me and i'm enjoying it and I think some of the films I've done that have been low budget films you have more of a say for obvious reasons 
they've been very kind of like good for me and enjoyable. And then working with the actors when I've started, I mean, I started as a wardrobe assistant. Everyone was a wardrobe assistant. There yeah. weren't these yeah. titles of principal costume. Everyone, everyone on, on a on a on a film. Yeah. Back in the day, was, you're a wardrobe assistant. No matter what yeah. you do, you're a wardrobe assistant. <laughs> yeah. But now, yeah, whether, whether, you, whether you're cleaning boots, doing the ironing, or, or exactly. looking after looking after Sean Connery, exactly, yeah. as a yeah. wardrobe assistant. Obviously, that's changed now, and. Um, and you know, there's key costume, and a lot of Americanisms have come in. And yes, you know, so yeah. I've been a principal costumer, which is basically doing the actors. So yeah. that's another side of things, you know. Or you know, within wardrobe, there's there's that opportunity to move within the department. And mm. because I came from making background, that's why Bloomfield kind of like, well, he'd be good at making that and going on set, and they'd use you. You know, and why not? Yeah, play to strengths. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. but I think most of my career, the last 25 odd years has been on set. And, and I, I do love the set, not just with mucking around with costume people, but working with camera people and directors and great props and art directors and mm-hmm. obviously traveling around. And I wouldn't have seen half the places I have seen if I hadn't been in the film industry. So, you know, I'm grateful for that to have, have yeah, a country yeah. that you wouldn't think. But, but isn't, isn't it a case sometimes, Phil, if you see the inside of a hotel that's in it somewhere exotic and then you go to a location that's somewhere exotic but you're not seeing it and then you back to the hotel room again and then back home. But, but yeah, I mean, the opportunity to travel must be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's places that you, you wouldn't necessarily go to. I mean, I, I've, yeah. I've done so much in... Morocco. Some people hate Morocco. I don't mind it at all. I mean, I know mm. Morocco like the inside. I mean, I've done about I don't know eight or nine films. In uh, I think me and Neil Murphy had a little tally up. You know, it's like who's who's ahead of each other. But that's <laughs> when every, every film was going to Morocco at the time. You know, there was every sword and sandal film was going to Morocco, and it's yeah. quite funny because everyone thinks I did Gladiator and I didn't. But, <laughs> yeah. but now I just smile and go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was in um, where was I? I was in Malta a couple of years ago on on Assassin's Creed, and I said to Tom Hornsby, "Do you know what, Tom? Everyone thinks I did Gladiator." And he went, "Really?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "It's just because I was in Morocco a lot, but I didn't do Gladiator." So, the, so I, I, we drive into the Malta studio, and the guy sitting next to me, Tom's driving. The guy sitting next to me was the uh, cost, costume prop maker. He said, "That's where I know you from, Philip." He said. This is where we did Gladiator together. And I said, <laughs> I said, I didn't do it. And then in the night, at the night I'm at the bar and the effects boys went, it's changed a lot, hasn't it, Malta? And I said, I've never been here before in my life. And they said, yeah, very funny. <laughs> do you remember when we did Gladiator film? And we went down the car, I said, I never did Gladiator. And they said, yeah, they still wouldn't accept it. And even the designer, <laughs> Sammy Howarth, said, do you remember when we did, and I'm like, I never, it's like, so... Now Tom says we might as well just put it on IMDb. Well, put it on there. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think maybe there's somebody walking around claiming something that um, you know, oh, no, looks looks a bit like you? <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean you do you do get to travel. Yeah, and it, it, it is a kind of boat. But as you say, you know, you're you're doing six days a week, and yeah. it's just if you're lucky, isn't it? You know, I did Bond last year, and that was great for locations. Yeah, and then you've got yeah. some other film, and you might not want to be in I don't know Belfast in the winter. Who knows? I mean, yeah. but it's it's mm. kind of good, isn't it? It's cultural, and you get to see yeah. places that you probably wouldn't normally put on your bucket list, you know? For sure, for sure. You mentioned stunts earlier, and again, that's a that's another sort of side of side of it that that you know I'd like to talk about because, of course, they have their own kind of needs and requirements and things. Um, and I'm assuming that you get on well with most of the stunt guys, don't you? Well, yeah. I mean, they've all, they're all supervised. They're all, you know, coordinating now. Yeah. I mean, the Rob Inches and Gary Powers and, and all them, you know, and Simon Crane even. And and I used to dress them all up and uh, when they were performers and they've all kind of become coordinators in their own rights. And it's good to see. Mm. And there's so many coming through, but they, they, you know, the stunts are great because they, they know when you put the time and effort into thinking about their needs and, and what needs to be rubberized and what should be polyurethane in armor. You can't yeah. these days put a big set of metal armor on a stunt and expect him to jump through a stained glass window, you know? No. So no. it needs a lot of thought these days and quite a lot of money to get it done. Mm. So that's always a, a, always on my mind about the stunts and uh, how comfortable they are and, and how this is going to work. Yeah. I mean, Saving Private Ryan was a stunt-heavy film and there was a lot of fire gags. 
and they would trust you, the costumers, you know, me and Pete Hornbuckle, to kind of, you know, we'd we'd put their undergarments in cell gel overnight and freeze them up and everything, and and we mm. we would be the last port of call before they got torched. I know some costumers say, well, that's wrong because if something went wrong, you'd get the blame. But that's how it worked back then. I think things have changed a bit now because of health and safety. But there wasn't yeah, so much and, back then. And yeah, they didn't trust you to do the job that, you know, you talk about it and, 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 and work out the solution and how it's going to work. And once mm. you get that trust, then, uh, I mean, even now, after all these years, I still get a lot of stuntmen sort of like, hey, hello, Goldie, and everything. And, you know, they're still very appreciative of the work that was done when they were younger and as a performance. Yeah, yeah. Because, again, you know, it's it's easy to sort of say, well, look, that's you, you're being paid to jump through that window, so, you know, you, you, you get it sorted out. But actually to, to consider what they need to do that and to be safe and to be confident, again, yeah. it's a... Yeah, it's, you know, it's 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 a good gift to be able to inspire confidence in those guys because they are literally putting their lives on the line. Sometimes. They are, they are, and uh, especially mm. with fire. I mean, yeah. I, I've got one funny story. It's probably not connected to stunts, but on Private Ryan when we did the the landing, the D Day landing, that was all yeah. done. Yeah, that yeah. was all done in Wexford. I was uh, going to say it was in Ireland, wasn't it? That one. It was, beach. and it was a private yeah. beach yeah. that was owned by some fella. Um, Carry Clow Beach, I think. It was just outside of Wexford. And it was a tidal beach. And we they shot with about 10 cameras. And Spielberg was set up little vignettes. So it would shoot a bit of Hanks here. And they'd say, oh, set up that bit where that guy gets blown up and his leg flies off. So we had a lot of amputees with us that were part of the stunt. They were start, part of the stunt fraternity. But yeah. they were kind of, they'd lost their leg by the, on the knee or the arm. Most of them are from motorcycle accidents, unfortunately. There was one gag that I did where this guy gets blown up in the air and his leg flies off. It's a split second in the movie, but um, it's there, but tide would come up. So every sort of hour, a klaxon would sound, and we'd all have to move up the beach a little bit. I mean, it was a vast beach, so it didn't matter as far as continuity was concerned. Right. So, so every hour, boom, and then we'd all move up, all the vehicles would move up, and we'd carry on filming. And so I'd I'd taken the guy's real leg, well, his prosthesis leg, his aluminium leg with his Nike trainer on it, the one that he owns, and yeah. I'd, I'd put it, I'd put the leg against a, a, a four by four, and then I'd put the um, prosthetic uh, film leg on with the blood, and then put the trousers on, and then sewed sewed up. The, the, where the leg's going to, to detach just by the knee. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, it went on for ages. We were waiting for Spielberg, waiting for Spielberg. And, uh, of course, we kept moving up the beach. And then, anyway, Spielberg would come over. He'd film it, you know, boom, thank you. And they all move off. And I was just left with this guy and uh, who, who was literally only had one leg now. The other one had blown off. And right. I turned around and I realised that I had, the vehicles had moved up the beach but and, I, and I'd left his leg and... Uh, well, his leg was basically floating, popping up and down in the Irish Channel when, when we had to put it back on. <laughs> I bet he was pleased. Yeah, he was. He was like, we left on our own. And then it was like, well, can I have my leg back now? And I'm like, well, I know I left it against this vehicle and the vehicles do it. But the vehicle had moved like 200 yards in the, in the interim. Oh, you know. Anyway, we got, fortunately, it, it floated. And we went out and rescued his leg, and, and we all had a drink in the bar that night in the Wexford Lodge. <laughs> but uh, yeah, little stories like that. But you know, wow. it's a stunt thing again. You know, it's it's always a good yeah. it's always good for crack with the stunts, and um, yeah, especially yeah. when you do a stunt heavy film away of that nature. You know, I think some of the best that particular film, some of the best stunt work I've, I've ever seen on film, really. Mm. I mean, I've got to say that first. I don't even know how long it lasts. Is it 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, half an hour? Yeah. From the moment, from the moment those ramps go down, it's like, my God, it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. No, it, was, it was spot on. Yeah, um, well, Joanna, Joanna Johnson and Dave Crossman did a great job. You know? Yeah. And yeah, Dave, they did. Dave's your man. He was the go-to man yeah. you know, for yeah. him and Joe. Yeah. For uh, for military, yeah. So yeah, they, good, they, good they, work, they, good work. Yeah, really good work, really good work. And then Band of Brothers, of course, which again I thought stood up very, very, very well. Joe Hobbs, another one. Yeah, another indeed. One yeah, sadly not with us anymore. Yeah, very sad. Very, very sad. So I know you come in to us, and you obviously go into costume houses because you were in Italy a couple of weeks ago. The relationship that you have with with costume houses important to you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm. I mean, I've never done the Italy thing before. I've always, you know, I've, I've had their boxes descend on me wherever I've been. Yeah. You know, yeah. tons of them all at once, you know, and it's like, oh, Rancarta, yeah, oh, Caruzzi, Costa de Arte. Yeah, they did kind of, but I've always kind of like, I'd love to go there one day. So I, I, I did, and it was great, yeah. uh, and also Spain. But, um, yeah. no, I mean, in, in the UK, it's you guys and, um, you know, and John Bright's outfit, really, isn't it? Yeah, but, um, yeah. You know, but I've been, you know, going to Angels since it was Bermans, Angels and Bermans, you know, mm. in Camden yeah. to be fitted as a kid. But, um, no, it is, it is important. And it's, uh, I don't know what we would do without you. <laughs> I wonder I wonder if we should put that green frock coat of yours in our star collection, Phil. I'll, <laughs> I'll find it for you when I come in next you week. You do, do, I do, do. do. It, I do see it. And I'd like to know who fitted me. I think it might have been Dave Whiting, but it was definitely in the... It was definitely in the eighties, and it was definitely from military. I think, right? And it was at Camden, yeah. but we'll look into that one. We'll yeah, it, it, it could it could well have been if it was early eighties. It certainly would have. Yeah, been. yeah, it, it was around been, that time. Yeah, been there. Kind of. yeah. So it might even have been me. It could have been. It could have been. But it was Ooh, great yeah, that you guys did it. You know, because we cause we were based in Holloway Road. We still are. Well, they, they you still did. are. Yeah, they, they still, still are. are. Yeah. So literally, yeah. you know, just up the road. Mm. Yeah. Now, Jonathan, Jonathan's really closely associated with them, and I know it's something that Tim supports. And, you know, I think rightly so. Um, we do it with a couple of drama schools as well. You know, we do it with Lambda and, and Guildhall, you know, getting people in early and getting them used to working sort of professionally, if you like, is 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 very important for the future. Yeah, um, and, absolutely. You know, we've, we've all got to consider the future and... and, and you know the the industry's got to go on and got to got to thrive. And you know, despite all the stuff that's going on this year, it feels pretty good at the moment in terms of. No, don't, let me rephrase that. Doesn't feel pretty good in terms of what's yeah. going on. Yeah. But in terms of the industry, and as you mentioned, you know Amazon and Netflix, all those people desperately making productions because they need them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I think it is it is a very busy time. Yeah, I mean, Disney's invested into Pinewood uh, mm. for 10 years, and then Netflix have invested into Shepparton. Um, yeah. I mean, you can't get a parking space for love nor money now. It's just loads of names. No. But, but, yeah, but, yeah but, well, I was um, going to say, never, you know, never was that easy as a visit. No, it wasn't I mean, that good in the first place. Yeah. But, um, no, you'd drive around for ages trying to find yeah, a slot. Yeah. But, um, but it, yeah. it, it's only, you know, it's only a good thing. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think the government realises that, that, you know, how much money... They, they, we do generate with yeah. everything, and countries realise what we generate by going to other countries. So there's, there is, there's a slice of the pie for everyone, I think. Um, yeah. And and I think as long as that continues, and the government don't suddenly go, oh no, let's not give as much tax break and relief as we are doing. I don't know why they would, but who knows? Yeah, it, it will remain so. I mean, it only has to have one person though crazy enough to say this tax relief is too much then they will go elsewhere and, yeah. and that's the thing um so it's that fine balance but at the moment and it has been touched with for the last i would say five to seven years it's been incredibly buoyant yeah. um yeah. and it yeah. was it, you know it used to be what am i going to do this year it's like well i've been asked to do this this and this you know so for younger guys and kids coming in you know to the industry and and it's like it's a good time to start because yeah, there's yeah. a lot of TV going, and uh, I always think that's a good way to start, and then move on from there. And if you're yeah. lucky to start on a big film, which I did in costume, and never look back really, but that was just the way it panned out. But it, it's kind of, I think it's a good time, um, yeah. and, and I I can't see it kind of diminishing very that's soon. The sound, that's the sound. That's the sound of me knocking on wood. Yeah, and I mean. You've, you've, you've said, you know, that kind of the shotgun effect of, of, of blast it out there and, and you'll get one or two hits out of it, but uh, which is a very good piece of advice. But there's a young there's a young person who 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 wants to get into the business. What what one piece of advice would you would you recommend, Phil? Well, I was kind of, as I say, I wanted to be in the film industry, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what age were you when you decided that? I mean, virtually every person I've talked to on these has said, well, I kind of fell into this. You know, I was interested in art or I was interested in this or I found costume. You actually, at no, an early age, wanted to be in the movie industry. In yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I from thinking. at least six or seven. Really? I wanted okay. to be in the yeah. film industry. And obviously, I think, 
you didn't know exactly what the jobs were or whatever, but I was aware of it. My mum was big on films and westerns and what have you. Right. And I think, you know, as I said, with the cine camera, with my dad, I understood it all. And yeah, I didn't want to do anything other than be in film in, in any capacity. Yeah. And I think the advice I got when I was younger from my auntie had a, a friend, uh, you know, a drinking pal in old Windsor who was an old effects artist. Paul Freeman, I think his name was, or someone. But, you know, it was that thing back then, is once you're in, you're in. Yes. It's, it's yeah, what absolutely. you do when you're yeah. in. It's like, yeah. it's getting yeah. in. And, of course, yeah. it was un- unionised when I started. So I was making, after I did Kiss Before Dying in 1990 at Shepparton, I started making some uh, arrowheads for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And, oh, did you? Well, that's yeah. John Bloomfield again. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the union guy came around and said, let's see your card. And, of course, I wasn't in the union. So, uh, you know, off the premises, thank you. It was a very closed shop back then. It's not now. And it's that thing of once you're in, it's where you move within it, you know. It doesn't have to be costume. You can. St- I know people have started in costume and gone into art, art, art design or people that have been in a production office and have become costume coordinators. Yeah. You know, there's all these new jobs now within the departments, within costume coordinating and co-coordinating and because there is so much yeah. more stuff yeah. and computer and everything. But I think it's just stick to your guns. I mean, I set up a little studio in my bedroom to make foam latex heads and things. Did you? And much to the annoyance of my parents. But um, <laughs> And the tenacity of, like, get a good CV to get. I mean, I only had one thing on my CV, which was, like, Young Engineer Great Britain. And, uh, all right. Not it, bad. It, it's just it's a not, not a bad thing. thing. And it it, it kind of looked good. And we, we yeah. got a lot of exposure on TV. So... But that that all started at school, you know, and that all started yeah. with a couple of good teachers who saw potential and said, maybe you should put that project into... I've, it's always been other people that have pushed me. It's like, I mean, I pushed myself <laughs> once. Once I saw the potential, then I pushed myself. But it's always been like, like for example, my drama teacher said, I'm going to, put, I'm going to get you in the National Youth Theatre. You know, you should apply for mm. the National Youth Theatre because they saw that I could be, maybe become an actor. And then it was my design and technology teacher we need to put this into the Young Engineer Great Britain. Or We didn't start with the Young We started with a Nelex, which was North East London and Essex, and then we went to the Young Engineer Great Britain. Yeah, yeah. But all these things were pushed on by me and my teachers, you know. So it's important to have a few teachers and mentors and people that you look to and they look to you and see potential. One good teacher is just gold dust when you've got a yeah. great teacher. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough to have a few. And then it's just, it was literally driving up and knocking on doors and, mm-hmm. and not taking no for an answer. I mean, I was just about to leave the studios having everyone said, no, we haven't got anything, we haven't got anything. And then we were just leaving Shepparton and there was a, a little shed called DBP Models and Effects. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Soon yeah, yeah, yeah. Soon as yeah. you drove into, it's gone now, but soon as yeah, you drove it has. into Yeah, yeah, it was on the left-hand had, hand side, wasn't it? That's right, they had the shed. Yeah. And, you know, I went yeah. in there with, with my my portfolio and and Brian Mount was in there with a little model the size of Mm. about six inches long made out of lolly sticks and he said oh we've got to make this 32 foot long can you make it and of course I said yeah of course I can even though what I had in my TV had nothing to do with what he was showing me (laughs) but you know that was it then I was on a film and I was I was in and then I think it gets easier and easier so don't give up. Carry on going. I mean, you're 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 right. What you say about you know having peach, people that recognise the potential, but let's be perfectly honest, Phil. You got to have the potential for them to recognise. Sure, you yeah. Know. You get you get so, um, out quite quickly if you're no yeah, good at what you do. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But then it's that catch twenty two. It's like the best place to learn. What I mean, back then there was Wimbledon and there was I think two uh, you know universities or colleges that 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 did specialise in, in in costume. But yeah. now there's a whole host of stuff, you know. That now it's now it's uh, you can mm. pretty much get a course in costume on on in in most units, you, you know, faculty yeah. or whatever. Yeah. No, you do get sussed out if you. But then again, you still got to learn, you know. So it's a fine line, isn't it? Of, of, yeah. of learning learning yeah. on the job because there's no there's no there's no there's nowhere out there that's going to teach you to do standby on films. Um, no. Because until especially, you especially it, when you when you're on the sticky end, as you yeah. said, you know, basically it's, it's exactly so it's, yeah. it's the people yeah. you are with and uh, that, that that see the potential. Um, yeah. But you're right; you do have to have something going for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have, and I'm really pleased that we've had. Oh, this. thank you, Richard. 
I'll be in to see you next week with your fiver. <laughs> yeah. No, mate, it's gone up. It's, gone up. Yeah. it's not a fiver now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've had 54 minutes, and that's, that's a per minute. No, listen, I... I I'm really, really pleased that you agreed to do it, and I'm pleased that we persevered after the disaster on Friday. And I know the we're near both a pair of technophobes. I didn't know there were different are. browsers. Who told me there were different <laughs> browsers? I don't yeah, even know Chrome what a browser is. <laughs> I don't know what a browser is. I thought it was like slang for like trousers. But I don't know catalog and browsers, but no, I um, yeah, yeah really it's been fun. Me. It's been good. And yeah, um, I thought Chrome was a metal finish myself, but then we are. I know, and anyway, we got there in the end. That's the main. No, I know, and 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 it's been very insightful, Phil. I mean, it really has. So, Good. so thank you for so. that, my friend. And uh, as you say, with or without the, for the benefit of the tapes, there is no five, and no money would exchange hands. No. Over this. But, but I do, I do look forward to seeing you next week. Of course. All right, mate. Well. I'll come and see you. You take it All easy. Right. Thank All you. right, Phil. Cheers, man. So, Gladiator. Yes, yeah, so Gladiator. <laughs> I know. Talking about being accused of something that you've never done. Uh, yeah, interesting, eh? Interesting. Really interesting. I mean, you don't... I'm, I'm sure people... I don't know if people do before they listen, if they ever look up the person's name on IMDb before they start listening to the interview, but his his CV is phenomenal. I mean, just from the, the, the films, ignoring what the filming might have been like, the productions he's worked on, I mean, I know you normally say with people they're large and small ones. I don't think there's a single small production Goldie's ever done. No, I don't think so. I think uh, I think it, he's been on some real blockbusters, uh, apart from Gladiator. Um, and, and one of the few people that we've actually interviewed who kind of knew from a very early age if not what he wanted to do within the field, but certainly knew knew which field he wanted to work in, which, you know, so many of us seem to have stumbled into it one way or another. He's a real testament to the whole just just work and find something you can do and you enjoy yeah. and the rest will follow. Yeah. And it's lo- it was lovely to hear. I mean, the Young Engineers of Britain Award thing, I had no idea about that Um with Goldie, I, I would definitely. Sorry, I've got to stop calling him that because he doesn't like it. Phil, yeah. uh, I would definitely advise anyone who who knows Mr. Goldsworthy, if you want to try and find the photo. <laughs> of I'm looking at a moment. <laughs> a young <laughs> Philip Goldsworthy yeah. with his remote-controlled robotic head from the Young Engineers of Britain. I I should say this comment very carefully because I'm one who's going this direction. He has hair. <laughs> he, he, he does have hair. You'd have thought he'd have the decency to do his tie and his collar up, though, wouldn't you? Yes. So, no, I mean, it's, it's just, it, it was a fascinating chat. It really was. And it is someone who has done done a lot of different things within the department. He doesn't, I could be wrong, and you can correct me, Richard, he doesn't seem to care what he does as long as he's working and he's enjoying it. I think that's exactly right. I mean, you know, the, the nice thing about Phil is that there are no airs and graces. You know, what what you see is what you get. And what you get is a very conscientious and diligent worker, you know, guy that just just gets on with it. He's um, no, he's he's working at the moment on a on a um, a fantasy production as the sort of the the armory and the the men at arms sort of expert, and it's great. It's just great seeing him, watching him work. It's good. We we had wanted to. We we, we still do. There are different people. We are actually. It's targeting is the wrong word. We want to speak yeah. to because we think they'll be interesting. And there's there's certain roles that we we are trying to get to speak to people about. And we wanted to speak to Goldie originally because he has done standby for so long, yeah. and we thought it would be a really interesting conversation. But the whole point is, you can't really just pin Phil down and say he's a he's a, he's a standby. He's not. He's so much more. And I really hope everyone got that out of. Out of the yeah, conversation, so do I. and I do, and I do strongly urge everybody to look at that picture. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, I won't be evil enough to use it on, so, on social media, not unless, not unless there's enough requests. But uh, it is out there. Is that what they call a mullet? <laughs> Now, normally at this point, we will talk about the conversation we will be releasing next week. But next week, we're not going to be releasing an interview with anyone in the industry. No. In fact, we're going to just release a conversation between the three of us, although there's only two of us on this uh, this conversation at the moment because Jonathan, unlike Richard and I, are working, so he is busy on set. Some fitting or some filming or something, I think. So, um, 
Yes, yeah. so he, he he's left us to our own mm. devices. And so no, next week we're going to just have a nice sort of catch up of where everything is with the industry, with angels, with costume, and where we're going to be going with the podcast going forward. The we are going to take a break for Christmas, which would be so next week will be our last podcast before the sixth of January. But the next week will be a conversation between us about, as I said, the lay of the land, what's going on in the industry, what's going on with us with the podcast, and just to look back at what has, for lack of a better phrase, been 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 a year. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Anna Caribles. I, mean, I, don't think yes. You, I don't think you pronounced the first word in quite that way. Um, we were <laughs> going to say, weren't we? If anybody, I mean, we we are getting emails from people and. Yes. contacts which we really like and this isn't going to be a phone in um no it's not and it, again it's it's not the set we'll, we'll, we'll respect your anim- anonymity it's more a case of if you send us any questions yeah. please do yeah. the podcast that angels will ask them and we do we do see what everyone sends and we do see the comments mm-hmm. on the social media and the little things that people might think I-, I hope you don't mind no we really no. don't we've had some really interesting requests including one which I actually thought was quite a fire one, which is, could we actually speak to a few more people who have been educated in Scotland, which I actually don't think is a bad request in itself at all. So, you know, if, if there is a chance for me to go and a Mrs. Trellis writes in to ask it, um, <laughs> that, would, that would be great. If anybody has got anything they'd like us to kind of chat or ramble about next week, then great. So there is no sound bite for you all next week no, so um <laughs> just us saying goodbye until next week then until next week and we promise we'll bring a grown-up with us and mr Littman will return <laughs> till next week um thank you very much and we will speak to you all next bye week.